Good morning. Uh, if you will, turn in your Bibles to Matthew 5, 17 through 30. And with that, when I was going through this and writing my notes and what I, I started out with message title of called Clearing the Confusion. And by the time I got to the end of the message, the latter part of the message, I thought, no, the message title probably should be more like Guard the Heart. And you'll see that. We're looking at the Sermon on the Mount. And as I said, really, I think in the introduction, if a pastor would get up and just read the Sermon on the Mount and sit down, everybody would think they hadn't been to church because so many people have heard the words that they don't recognize it as a sermon. But it's important that we understand the message, and there's a lot of things in it. But I want us to look at some things this morning. I asked you, have you ever got so mad at a person you just yelled and screamed at them with all your you got after they leave the room? Have you ever been so mad and frustrated with someone that you lost shit sleep? Have you ever threatened somebody? Have you ever wished bad upon somebody? Have you ever said to yourself, I could just kill that person? If you've answered yes to any of these or other type of questions that are very similar, then... And like I say, most people would say inside, underneath their breath and all, they've said probably every, about every one of them. But when you say that, you might not realize that you're recognizing and saying, you know, what I sinned. These are some of the sins that a lot of times we don't even think of as sin. But like I say, the scripture this morning on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is teaching, and really the scripture, we could go all the way down to verse 48, and I'm just going to try to hit some highlights as we go through, but I encourage you to go back and read and to study this section of it. Because like I say, it's important that we understand what Jesus is telling us. So like I say, if you will, open your Bibles and follow along or your electronic device, and let's read at least a section of this as we read Matthew 5, 17 through 30. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no ways pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But to whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Ye have heard that it was said of them of old, that thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore if thou bring thy gift to the altar and there remember that thy brother have aught against thee. Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way first to be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly while thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto you, Thou shalt by no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Ye have heard that it was said of them, by them of old, that thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Then if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. 
and cast it from thee, for if it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that the whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that if one of thy members shall perish, then not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. And Father, we thank you for your words. And Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit will fill this place, will help each and every person that is listening to understand your words. But most of all, beyond understanding, but to apply them, to follow them, to keep them in their lives that they may be your good and faithful servants, that they'll follow you out of love and not out of duty, and that they'll surrender their will to your will. Father, guide us this morning, that all things be to your glory. For it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Now last week we looked at the Beatitudes and we looked at four attitudes that God wants us to keep. And they tell us how the Lord will bless us with us when we have those attitudes. But here, the people have heard those things and are sitting there saying, how can we have that kind of attitude? How can we do those type of things? How can we be the type of person that Jesus wants us to have the character that he described? So obviously, in probably their minds, it popped and they're like, wow. Now Jesus says we have to have the righteousness that exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees. And we need to step back and look at this because when we read the scribes and the Pharisees in the New Testament, a lot of us look upon them as evil and horrible people, manipulative. And they were lost in what they did. But in Jesus' day, the people saw them as the righteous. They're the ones that kept the law. They're the ones that explained to everybody how to keep the law so that they wouldn't fall into sin. They're looked upon as very holy men. Jesus exposed them, and we see that in the scriptures. But the problem of it is the people were raised up with them. And these are the ones that you look to and follow their example because they're the ones that keep the law and they're the, and all, they're the holy men. If you can follow them and be close, you'll be all right. How many of you have ever had somebody in your life you just looked up to and you just thought, wow, that is the greatest person? But later on, when you get older or something happens and they do something that is wrong, that your life is shattered. And then you're lost. And here Jesus is telling them, you have to exceed those that you look up to. You have to be better than what they are. You won't get into heaven. <clears throat> you can imagine what's running through their mind. They're like, well, if they can't get into heaven, how can I? These were the ones that taught us about God and how that we can keep the law and be saved. At this point, there's probably a discouragement, a concern among the people. And it was probably disheartening to them in some ways. And those religious leaders that were around and following Jesus and watching him, they're, you know, throughout the things and that Jesus did throughout his life, they're sitting there thinking Jesus came to destroy the law. That's why he talks about fulfilling it. For if Jesus destroyed the law, it will create an uproar, obviously. But unfortunately for those religious leaders, it would remove the selfish power that they had made from enforcing the law. And they used it to control the people. But here Jesus was different and the leaders saw it. How is it that the way he teaches? He teaches as one with authority. They taught because they were taught by this Pharisee and this leader and this one. And they had grown up learning it and all in the Jewish um, schools and 
under the different teachers. And so that's how they got their information and how they got their understanding of the law. But here Jesus walks right out, and obviously Jesus grew up as a Jewish boy, but he didn't grow up to be one of a Pharisee or a priest or anything. He grew up as a carpenter's son. And yet he steps on the scene and he speaks as if he has complete authority of the word. And it startled him, it scared him. Scripture tells us, for there are three that bear a record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And that's in 1 John 5 and 7. Scripture refers to Jesus as the Word. That's why he could speak with such authority, because he was the Word of God. And he taught from that. And that's what amazed the people. How can he teach this way? And understand it with such completeness. And then Jesus lived a life and he and they said that he defied the laws, but what he was doing was wiping out the traditions. He healed people on the Sabbath. How many of you would be upset if you went to the hospital with a loved one or someone who is in need of care on a, on a Sunday and you got to the hospital and the doors were closed? What would you think? Or if every Saturday night they emptied the hospitals out and said, you all have to go home. You can come back Monday, but we don't take care of nobody on Sunday. There is a danger in that type of thinking, and obviously you see it when I put it that way. But the scribes and Pharisees and religious leaders thought healing on Sunday was a wrong. It was, it was an act of work that shouldn't be done. That was breaking the law when Jesus did it. But it really was their traditions. He walked past their traditions and went to God's word and followed God's word. We have to watch that in churches. I've seen it, like say, I've traveled around different churches in this area and then like say where I grew up. There's a lot of churches that put traditions higher than God's word when it comes to certain things. We've always done it that way. Why? I have to ask that question sometimes with them, like, why? We've always done it that way. And I've been in meetings where we had to ask the question, show me in the Bible, that's what it says. But sometimes we'll put traditions ahead of God's word. And Jesus knew that the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders had done that in many cases. The people that Jesus associated with riled them. It offended them. He spoke to a prostitute. He had dinner with a tax collector. He actually touched a leper. And those people sitting out there getting alms that we throw money at just to get away from them, he sits down, he'll talk to them, he heals them. And those people that are unclean that we don't allow in the temple because they've done something wrong, he'll sit down with them and feed them. Jesus came to heal the sick, not the physicians. And because he would talk to those people and help those people and feed those people and teach them, it offended them. The religious leaders, and they said, he's wrong, he shouldn't be doing that. How do you heal the sick unless you deal with them? How do we help those who are in trouble unless we go to them? Remember, Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn people. I came to save. In order to save people, you have to reach out to the sinners. There's a great many churches that think, well, if we deal with the good people in the community, we'll be okay. I ask you, how did the good people get to be good? Somebody had to teach them. Somebody had to help them somewhere so that they didn't go wrong. We have many in our community that need that help. The Sermon on the Mount is packed with so many things that we could just go verse by verse and probably almost... Teach a lesson on each verse a week at a time. 
But I want to move into the next section because it's the section I want us to understand today. As we're going through the Sermon on the Mount, he came to fulfill the law, not destroy it. I'm going to give us some examples of that. Jesus was trying to get the religious leaders to understand the law is more than black and white. There are people, and I've sat down and I've listened to them. I, I'd ask you this question. How many of you this week should have gotten at least one speeding ticket? That somewhere where you drove, you exceeded the speed limit by one mile per hour. That in a 20 mile an hour zone, you drove 21. In a 25 mile an hour zone, you drove 26. In a 35 mile an hour zone, you let the car get up to 36. Or 46 in a 45, or 56 in a 55. How many of you did that at least once this week? Ah, some honesty, there we go. You broke the law. Did, how many of you got a ticket this week? No horns. But yet you admit you broke the law. Jesus was trying to get them to understand just because somebody breaks it doesn't necessarily mean it's a horrible thing in the sense of it's the world's going to end. There's some people who want to take the law and say, if, you know, you do this, you know, you need to be punished and thrown under the jail. He wanted them to understand the intent of the law. The fullness of it. And I don't encourage anybody to speed, so don't, please don't go out and get tickets this week or break the speed limit. But what I'm saying is there's those that would say that you are a horrible person because you broke the law this week. The Pharisees and Sadducees would do that, and the scribes would do that to the very nitpicking. But Jesus wanted them to understand the fullness. It's not cut and dry. If your child is dying on a Sunday and you're rushing them to the hospital, I promise you, and I've done this not because my child was dying, but I remember Karen being in labor. She went into labor and we had to rush to the hospital. I promise you, I broke the law that night trying to get Karen to the hospital because her contractions were so close, they were down to less than a minute, and she was, I didn't even think she could hardly breathe. I thought, she's going to have this baby right here in my vehicle. But there's some that would say, oh, it's horrible what I did and everything. I shouldn't rush her to the hospital to get her help. There are people that say, oh, you don't dig the well out to get the child that's fell down on it on a Sunday. Jesus is trying to get them to understand the law, the fullness of it. Many churches today are like the Pharisees and the scribes. They want church to be black and white, cut and dry. You do this, it's wrong. You do this, you're good. You do this, you go to heaven. You don't do this, you go to hell. And they want it to be that way, but it's not that way in sense. They want Christian walk to be a bunch of do's and don'ts. And I feel sorry for those because I have grown up and I've understand I've been blessed with some great teachers. I don't work and walk under do's and don'ts. I work and walk under spiritual freedom. I follow my Savior. He'll never leave me to where I should not be. If I follow my Savior, I'll never do what I'm not supposed to do. And I promise you, there are great things that come out of that. And I was taught that from a very young age by a wonderful minister, a friend of mine. He says, if you'll follow Jesus, you don't have to worry about the do's and don'ts. And you can be free and live the life that he wants you to have. So let's look at a little bit what Jesus said. He talked about adultery, and he fulfilled the definition of it. Adultery starts on the inside, not on the outside. If you look upon a woman or a man with lust, you conceive that within your heart. You have broken the law. You have sinned. I want to really call it it's sin. 
because you have done the act already without ever moving, ever touching. You've committed adultery in your heart. The physical act is just a fulfillment of what you've already done mentally and in your heart. The bad thing is when you act upon it outwardly and physically, you drag somebody else into your sin and drag somebody else with you. Two wrongs don't make a right. If you look at anger upon somebody and you're so angry with them and you wish bad upon them or even to the point that, oh, I could just kill that person and be so mad, you've already done it in your heart. The prodigal son, we get so mad, upset with him because he took everything his father was going to give him and went out and he's wasted it. We talk about how you know, horrible he was. He went and chased the ways of the world. But his brother who stayed with his father was just as bad because he did not have any love in his heart either. When he came back, he couldn't even celebrate that his brother came back. He was more concerned, though, is my father going to give him more or something else? When we allow sin in our heart, We think evil of somebody. Jesus said you've already done it. That person that crosses you and you get mad and angry and whatnot and you say something under your breath or whatever or, or get mad at them. You've already done it. That person will never know that you did it because you kept it under your breath, but you've already polluted yourself with sin. All our emotions, a lot of people didn't say, well, then why did God give us emotions? All our emotions have a good side and a bad side. There is such thing as righteous anger. Jesus demonstrated that. But a lot of people like to think my, their anger is righteous because they've been wrong. Or they didn't get their way. But we should not act out with that. Because the damage is done to us, not the other individual. Jesus goes on to talk about swearing, not the cursing type, but the taking of an oath. Why would you ever have to swear on a Bible or swear on heaven or swear on this or whatever to convince somebody that you're telling the truth? Jesus makes it very clear in the set of scripture. He says, let your yes be yes and your no, no. If people know that you never have had a habit of lying or telling them a falsehood or misleading them or trying to hustle them or con them, why would they ever doubt your word? It is because we so much act like the world and talk like the world and conduct ourselves and our speech like the world that no one knows who's telling them the truth and who's trying to hustle them. But Christians should be known as being totally complete with integrity, honesty, truth. And then when we say yes, we mean yes, and when we say no, we mean no. On down in the scripture, it talks about an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And we all, oh, we love this one. We recently had this going across the nation with all the riots. If they could have done it, there'd been lynch mobs across this nation all over the place. And innocent people would have been killed. I have no doubt that there have been some innocent people killed and wrongly killed. I have no problem with that. I understand that. But when we say we're going to take it into our hands, we're in danger. It's called social justice. And when we put the hands of justice in the mob, we're in trouble. That's why God established governments and leaders. But the damage is not on what's going on on the outside. It's what's happening to the people in their heart. The anger, the frustration, and the thinking of ill things towards other people. Jesus says for us that we're to turn the other cheek. When somebody wrongs us, we're to turn the other cheek. 
allow God to carry out the justice through his way and his will. It is not ours to judge. It is not ours to be the jury, and, and it's definitely not ours to be the executioner. But we need to learn to forgive. We need to learn to let things fall on God's hands because when we start trying to be the judge, jury, and executioner, we start harboring feelings in our lives that we shouldn't have. In Jesus' day, a soldier could walk up to you and say, carry all my gear, carry my shield, carry my backpack, carry all my goods. And you had to pick them up and you had to carry them one mile. This is where this comes from. And people would, from their house, they would go out and put a stake on the road one mile from their house in each direction. So if a soldier came up to them while they were working, they'd pick it up. And when they got to that stake, they'd go, bloop, and they'd drop it and walk off. They followed the law. They did what they were supposed to and quit. Jesus says, pick it up and keep going another mile. Why? Because he wants you to physically have a witness. To show that you're not only going to do what you have to do, but you'll go the extra mile for someone else because you care. It's called evangelism in action. It's what so many churches need to do. What so many Christians, I shouldn't say churches, it needs to be Christians because the churches are just a body of Christians. But so many Christians need to get their elbows dirty to work in the community physically to reach out and show that we care. Jesus spoke on your neighbors, on loving your neighbors. You know what? It's real easy to love somebody if you go out to each day and say, hey, how you doing? And they say, hey, back. And, you know, how's the kids? Kids are fine. How's your kids? You know, it's real easy to be nice and loving to those type of people. But it's real hard to be nice to those people who are next door and got their radio blasting so loud it keeps you up at night. You hear all the yelling and screaming and they don't keep their yard as clean as you want them to keep it and all. And we have trouble dealing with people like that. Jesus says we need to love them. It's easy to love someone who's like you and fits your, your standards. But Jesus says you need to love those who don't and even those that think ill and despise you. See, you can get rid of an enemy by destroying them or making them your friend. The illustration and one of the commentaries gave that I was studying this, and I thought this was interesting. What Jesus did, he took the law. Imagine the law is an acorn. And where the Pharisees and the scribes and all were thinking that Jesus was coming to destroy the law, they were expecting him to take that law and just crush it. But Jesus did something different. He took that acorn. He didn't destroy it, so to speak, and he planted it in the ground, and it began to grow. And to be what it really was supposed to be. Not just an acorn sitting on a shelf. But it was growing into a massive tree. The law is not just black and white. You have to apply it with love. You have to apply it with caring. And you have to understand that it's not yours to execute. Each time that we act out, not outwardly but in our heart what we're doing is taking a brick and we're building a wall each time we get mad at somebody and all we get upset with them we're just building a brick wall each time we don't love that person next to us our enemies we're building a wall each time we don't go out and go the extra mile with somebody we're building a wall Each time that we have a lustful thought in our hearts, we are building a wall. And before long, you're going to have a wonderful brick wall, or maybe even a house that surrounds you. And what you have done is built this wall between you and God. Because you've harbored all these things in your heart. 
you build up because each brick is a sin. And you surrounded yourself with sin. And you said, it's okay. It's okay if I don't speak nice to that person. It's okay if I get angry at that person and lash out. It's okay if I conceive these thoughts in my heart. And the more that you think it's okay, the more that you're building this wall and you're separating yourself from God. And then you start asking, why doesn't God answer my prayers? Why do I feel so alone? And we find out that because we're separating ourselves from God. Why don't I understand what I need to do? Why am I making so many bad decisions? Why is my life going so south? <laughs> it's because you've enclosed yourself in a wall of sin. And you think it's okay. Sin cannot come before the Father. We cannot harbor sin in our hearts and say it's okay and still have a relationship with God and think that it's going to be good. But one of the great things that I loved, and as I was growing up, I sang in a choir at the church where I was growing up as a youth. It was called a youth choir, and we sang a, a song. And I remember one of the songs It started out as the Book of Acts. And I can remember the imagery of it. And it talked about Jesus bursting, not walking into, but bursting through the walls, breaking down the gates of hell from the inside out. The power that he had to overcome sin. Jesus can do that in your life. If you have built this wall and continue to put these bricks up and and all you can, Jesus can break that down. You'll never tear it down. You build a wall between you and God, you will never tear that wall down. But Jesus can. Jesus can. But you've got to do one thing. You've got to surrender. You got to say, Lord, I've messed up. Lord, I've done what I'm not supposed to do. I've sinned. Even worse, I've accepted that sin and allowed it to stay within my heart. Jesus, please tear down that wall. If the church is going to be the church, if the Christian is going to be the person that God wants them to be, then we have to tear down those walls within us and walk as Jesus has called us to walk, to live as Jesus has called us to live. And I encourage you this morning to have religious freedom in your life. If you will follow the footprints of Jesus, you will not go astray. Don't try to make your Christian walk with God black and white do's and don'ts. You'll know everything about him, but you'll never know him. But reach out and understand the love of God. Understand the fulfillment that God has, not only for the law, but for your life. What he wants you to be. Let that acorn within you grow that he plants. And be the mighty oak that he has you to be. If you've never given your life to Jesus, if you're living in a life of sin, you're saying, you know, I'm going through the world, but I'm sure not enjoying it. I fight battles every day, and I feel lost. I'm doing things in my life that I'm not proud of. And I pray that you'll call on Jesus and be saved. I say call because you have to purposely seek him out seek Jesus and be saved and he'll answer you call on him and say Lord I need to change 
I need you, Jesus. And he'll answer. If you make that commitment this morning, I pray that you'll come forward and let us pray with you. But for others who have already called on Jesus, look at your hearts, look at your lives and say, where are the walls and the bricks that I've built up within me? What am I accepting of? What sin do I live with and say that's okay because other people do worse than I do? Examine your hearts. And let's tear down these walls and bricks within us. And be clean that our righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees and the scribes. And that Jesus fully dwells within us and allows us to walk with him. So as we sing this morning, examine your heart. Look at yourselves and say, Jesus, I need some help. I can't move this brick. I can't tear down this wall. But Jesus, you can burst through and destroy it all.